So welcome everybody and a thank you for joining us again here at the Global Language Training and supporting our webinars. My name is Akara. As I mentioned before, I will do the first part of our webinar today and then I will be handing over to James midway through who will go through some resources and a stuff with you as well. So, like we said, today's webinar is on, like I said, today we're going to focus on uh, TPR. So, I'm going to go through with you uh, a little bit about uh, what TPR means, um, how we can use this in a classroom, and then, like I said, James will go through some resources and stuff with you as well. So, let's take a look then. What is a TPR or what does a TPR stand for? So this is a total physical response. Now, when I was a teaching, I also came across a TBR, total bodily response. So if you have come across this instead, don't be afraid. It's a pretty much the same thing, but TPR is the most common phrase that we use. And a total physical response, what does this mean? Where does this come from? So the idea um, basically comes from the children or babies are learning their mother, mother tongue versus the older people uh, struggling to learn a language. Why is there this a discrepancy? And the idea of a TPR was designed by Dr. James J. Asher. And like I said, it was based on the idea that the children seem to absorb languages and be able to learn and understand and hold on to languages much more easily than uh, people who are older or adults who are trying to learn a second language. And so the idea of a TPR is to get totally physically involved in the learning process. So if you think about when you have uh, young children or babies, how do babies learn? We don't learn through textbooks, right? If you're teaching a child, if you're talking to a young baby, then you're using very simple English. We're using lots of uh, things that we can show them. We're using all of our different physical senses. We're using sounds. We're pointing out to pictures. We're using things with lots of color. And so we're associating our learning with the, all of these different physical aspects. When we're a child, when we're a baby, when we start to learn our native language, our mother tongue language, it's usually stored in the front part of the left-hand side of your brain. And then as we form all of these uh, things that we're learning, and like I said, when we're associating these with the sounds and shapes and colors, then these are helping to form all of the different connections and patterns in our brain that help us to learn and to take in our language. If we learn a second language as we get older, these are actually stored in a separate part of your brain, in a different part of your brain. So when you're young, you're associating words with images, with sounds, with colors. When we're older, when we get older, we tend to learn languages through translation. So instead of looking at an apple and learning the word for apple in English or pingu in Chinese or French, palm, instead of going, oh, okay, this is an apple, this is English, what language will I translate it to? If you're younger, we skip out that section. And so that's what TPR is all about, trying to bring in the idea of a learning through all of these different physical aspects into the classroom to help us to better learn the language and to help us to hold on to it a little bit more. So think about, like I said before, children, children's books, children's toys. Quite often when we get children's books, you have touch and feel. So we can touch the different things, feel the different things, use the different colors. Quite often they have big pictures and a smaller amount of words. So these are the ideas that we want to bring into the classroom. If you don't have kids, then if you're thinking about older students, how can we work TPR into this? Well, think about going abroad, going on holidays. You're in a country that you've never been in before. You don't speak a lot of the language, but 
if you are watching people, paying attention to what they do, you may be able to pick up the meaning of the word. You might not totally understand it. You might not be able to translate it from one language to another, but you grasp the overall meaning. And so this is what we're trying to incorporate in our classes. You want to attach the words, the sounds that we're learning to the actions that they are also producing. So let's take a look then. How do we use TPR, total physical response, in a classroom setting? And there are a couple of areas to think about here, right? So we're talking about a physical response to learning, trying to be as involved in the learning process as possible to use as many senses as we can inside the classroom when we're learning. So I've split this into three areas to talk about. The first one being facial expressions. And this is important for two different reasons. Firstly, for attitude, right? Your students will mirror your attitude in class. If you come into class and you're not feeling the best, you're not having a good day, you can't expect your children to maintain a high energy, fun reaction to your class if you don't also share that with them. Okay, how many times have you heard the phrase, hmm, it was written all over her face? I didn't have to hear it, right? We can tell so much just by looking at somebody's face. And so this is going to be the same when you're using TPR in class. Whatever you do, you want your children to mimic you. So don't expect them to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. The second thing then when we're talking about TPR and uh, facial expressions is that we can also use our facial expressions um, as a way of teaching then as well. We can do our happy faces, sad faces, angry faces. And so this is what TPR is all about, trying to use our bodies, our expressions, and reduce the amount of words that we're using in class. And our facial expressions can be used much more just for teaching simple language like a happy, sad. We can also then use our facial expressions for encouragement in class as well. So like I just said before, making sure that you have a good attitude because the children can sense or your students can sense and mirror your attitude. It's going to be the same for encouragement or for prompts. Okay, if you're a student, if you have a younger student and you're asking them, hmm, how are you? And your student says, mm, I'm five. You're thinking, you're five, that's not right. Let's try again. How are you? Hmm, maybe they don't understand it. Let's prompt them. I'm happy. I'm sleepy. So we can prompt the courage, encourage the student and prompt the student with some actions to give them some ideas and to tap into the, to the vocabulary that they already know. On top then of using your facial expressions, we can use movement. So you've seen today a lot, I'm using my hands during the webinar. And so this is something that we need to think about when teaching in the classroom and especially online as well. Get the children, get your students moving. Now I am saying children quite a lot. I have noticed as well, rather than students, TPR is very, very useful and particularly effective with the younger students. You can use it, of course, with older students as well. We'll talk about that a little bit um, further on. But for the most part, it's particularly effective with the young, younger students, young learners. So we talk about movement, right? Think about charades, a game I'm sure that many of us have played, um, especially maybe around Christmas time in my family. That's when we usually get together and play a game of charades. And so here we're thinking about movement, get 
your whole body involves, okay? And this can be used again for vocabulary. So things are like a, hmm, a rabbit or a cat. There are different actions that we can use. Like I said, also happy, sad. We can do it for actions and for verbs as well, right? To run to talk, to climb, to swim. Getting your students active, getting them involved, helps them to uh, get, be involved with their, their learning, helps them to memorize things a bit easier. So what I would say about this as well with your movement is you want to keep it consistent. So whatever actions you are keeping for your verbs, you want to make sure that you use that um, same action every time you use that verb. So for example, some uh, simple uh, TPR that I would use in class, for instance, I. I use a one finger, one hand, because also I is one syllable, and I point to myself. I. Whereas if I want to say my, like a my apple, my grandparents, sometimes the students miss this word out. I use my whole hand and say my. Similarly then for different verbs, especially things like a want, can, have. These are some verbs that uh, quite often students mix up. So for me, I will use a crisscross like this for have. I have and a great way to them in this to your students demonstrate this to your students is simply oh i have what do i have and these are all up to interpretation right these are just uh, the actions the tpr that i use in my class it's up to you to decide what you feel is useful for your students or what action is it you associate with your words. So I use I have. For want, I typically do this, like a gimme, gimme, gimme. Hmm. I want. Hmm. For can, typically I would do this. I can. Hmm. I I can dance. Hmm. Can you dance? So you want to build up a repertoire of these actions and associate them with the, your vocabulary words, with your verbs. And then, like I said, we can also evolve these into questions um, and answer situations as well. And then, like I said before, we can use them for prompts. If children are getting stuck, maybe they're not understanding what you're asking for, or maybe they're a little bit shy, a little bit embarrassed. They can't think of the words they want to use. By doing some simple actions, you can help to prompt them and encourage them to keep speaking. Similarly, then, we can also use this to help for younger students with the sentence structure or syllables as well. Quite often, I find it quite useful for yes, it is and no, it isn't. So quite often this we use for a no or a negative, but we can use a, no, it is not. So I have a one action for every word in the sentence. For young learners, this helps them to uh, be aware of how many words are in the sentence, how many words they should be producing. No, it is not. Similarly, we can do yes, it is or yes, it is. It's up to you. It can be used in a lot of different ways depending on the type of student and the age of students that you have as well. The third thing then to think about is all of the extra props and materials that you can use. 
we can use sound. Sound is a big thing, especially being online. We can use a lot of sound and lots of extra materials as well. So you can see I have a teddy bear here beside me. Quite often I keep uh, little boxes, uh, just simple things from home. And you can use these for your vocabulary, but also these are quite handy for things like prepositions as well. So from this one box, I can teach uh, open, close, inside, under, on. I can, t I can uh, teach a take out, put in. So with one simple prop, I can, it opens up a range of different areas and actions for me to teach. And you'd like to get your student to mimic you, to encourage them to do the same thing, and it will help them along with the practicing and understanding what they're doing as well. And so, like I said, there's lots of different ways of, of TPR, of doing TPR, and it can be effective in all areas of our classroom as well. So teaching our vocabulary, teaching our verbs, we can have actions, we can have pictures, we can use our body, use our face. We can teach a classroom <clears throat> language and rules. So things like I said before, okay, everybody, let's uh, look at the teacher, mm, good job, okay, listen. And you might want to differentiate as well, like I said before, building up a repertoire, differentiate between what TPR you use. So for me, I tap twice for listen, mm, let's listen. But if I can't hear my student, then I'll lean forward and cup my ear. That way they know that this means, oh, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat? And this means, let's listen one more time. Again, this is just what I use. You guys can develop your own TPR. That's absolutely fine. Whatever you find easiest for you. You just want to make sure it's something that you remember so that you can teach it regularly with your students. Then things like uh, instructions. Everybody stand up, sit down, close your eyes. Uh, these will help you with your games and your time management like what we talked about the last time. Sentence structure again like what we said. Yes, it is. Uh, and the syllables, we can uh, use our fingers to count as syllables, especially for older students, more mature students, when you have a longer words that are difficult to pronounce, we can uh, use our fingers to show them the different syllables, how they will or should break up the word. And then with directions, with prompts, we can help students along, not necessarily by filling in words, but by doing some actions to tweak those memories, to bring something back, to help them think of what they want to say, and to help them encourage them and speak as much English as possible. So why do we use TPR then? What's the point of, of using TPR? Like I mentioned before, we use different parts of our brain depending on what kind of learning we are doing and when we did this type of learning as well. And so we're using TPR to make your lesson more memorable and more memorable in a lot of different ways. It's more fun, more fun for you, more fun for the students, and it makes things uh, more memorable for them in that aspect. So if they enjoyed games that you were doing, enjoyed a song that you were singing, enjoyed a funny noise that you made, they will associate all of this with their learning and with a good learning environment, which will encourage them to be more positive and more proactive about learning and enjoy your lessons. We will use both our right and left hand side of the brain. So the more involved we are with the learning, the more connections are being made um, up inside of our brain and uh, the easier it is going to be for us to learn things and to hold on to what we learned. We use TPR because we want to increase the student talk time and decrease our teacher talk time as much as possible. So what better way to decrease the amount of time that you spend talking in class 
than to not speak at all and have a game of charades and see how long you can get through your, your lesson without really talking much. This is a really big part of an ESL, especially with younger students. We want to get them to produce the language and form the language by themselves with as little help as possible. And then we can use TPR for classes of a range of different sizes. So whether you're classroom teaching, whether you're online teaching, whether you're teaching a big group of 30 students or a small group of two or three, your TPR can be used and adapted to all sizes of class and a or placement of class, so what, like I said, whether you're teaching online, whether you're teaching outside, whether you're teaching in a classroom, being active and using your hands, using all of these different props and can be used as well. Also then with the young learners and with older learners too. So like I mentioned before, TPR is very, very effective with the young students. But as the students get older, of course, we can still include it a little bit because like we said, we're thinking always in the back of our mind, how can we reduce that teacher talk time? So these are a couple of things about a TPR we've gone through already. What exactly does it mean? Where does it come from? the different areas and things to think about when we're using it in a classroom, and then why we use TPR as well. So I'm actually just gonna X out of this at the moment. I'm going to stop screen sharing with you guys. And from here, I am going to hand over to James. James is going to um, go through a couple of uh, more um, resources with you and explain to you how to uh, use TPR within the classroom. So let me just swap him over. James, off you go. Alrighty. Um, hello, everybody. My name is James Bonilla, Academic Director for Global Language Training. Welcome. Cara, that was very nice as usual. Um, Thank you. Very, very informative, very clear. So what I'm going to do right now is jump a little in there and um, sort of like complement everything that Kara has taught us today with uh, some practical aspects, okay? What I want to talk about today is some activities and resources. Now, the biggest question that I get from teachers is, yeah, well, I mean, when I'm in a classroom environment, that's cool and whatnot, and I can make circles and, you know, interact with the students and jump and whatnot and get them engaged. How do you do it online? Well, exactly the same way. I mean, if you got Zoom, um, <clears throat> the cool thing is that you can have the view with all the different little squares and you, have, you can have the, the students looking at you and you looking at what the students are doing. But the important thing is that you have to be very energetic, right? You have to be, how should I say, less passive in, in your body language, not in your teacher talk. Like Kara said, it's very important that we minimize teacher talk and we maximize student talk and participation and production, right? Now, that being said, every time that we say TPR, the first thing that comes to mind is Simon Says, right? And Simon Says is a very simple game. Uh, it's a game that can be enjoyed by small children, bigger children, teenagers, adults, okay? And what I, the way that I like to do it with small children is Hold on a second. And maybe use a video of the many videos that we have in YouTube. With, with, with an adult crowd, I would simply say, and I want everybody to follow me on this one, just say, okay, guys, we're going to play Simon Says. Just please do what I do, or please do as I say. And I would actually stand up, you know, and sort of like fix the camera. And, well, of course, you need to have some good space. Sorry about that. Okay, everybody. So I want everybody... When I say Simon says, you're gonna do why, what I ask you to do, okay? Ready? Simon says, touch your head. All right, I only see Ahmed and Kara. Okay, Catherine. Okay, Simon says, touch your shoulders. Simon says, touch your hips. Touch your chest. I'm touching ah, my Ahmed, Simon <laughs> didn't say. 
So you feel for that one. So again, with children, you can use uh, a whole bunch of videos that you find on, on YouTube. And let me show you just one of them, okay? It's time to play a game called Simon Says. I expect you all know how to play this one, but I'll just explain it anyway. I'm going to give you some things to do, but you should only do them when Simon says so. So if I say, for example, Simon says, clap your hands, you should clap your hands. That's not good, right? But if I just say, clap your hands, then you shouldn't. Or if you yeah, do, yeah. you may find right. that you'll be out. Okay, let's have a go, shall we? Simon says, clap your hands. Simon says, touch your nose. Simon says, scratch your head. Wiggle your hips. Was anybody wiggling? Yep. Because I never said that Simon said, wiggle your hips, did I? Well, that was just a practice. Let's have another go. All right, let's have another go. Simon says, wave your arms in the air. Simon says, touch your toes. Simon says, sit down. Stand up. Uh. Oh, dear. Did anybody stand up? Well, if you did, you better just stay sitting down because you're out. Sorry. <laughs> Simon says, hop on one leg. Simon. All right, so basically, where do you get this stuff? And this stuff is really, really engaging to the point that my, my little kid, I always speak about him. Let's put him on camera over here. Ah, this is Sammy. Say hello, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Yeah, he's over here, like, oh my God, who are these people? All right, Sammy, <laughs> go, ahead. go with mommy. There you go. All right, so he actually got curious by, by looking at the illustrations and over here in the sound and he came over here like, oh, I wanna play, I wanna play. So these type of tools will really help you. Now, where did I get this video from? Just went to YouTube, just basically on the search bar, I put Simon Says, and this, one, this was the first one of many videos that came up. So again, YouTube can be a fantastic source for you know, a lot of these activities. And if you're not too histrionic, if you're not too expressive, if you don't feel comfortable, you know, going, yay, okay, Simon says, then use a video. And I, I saw Chani smiling a lot. You know, I saw a lot of people getting into it. I saw Natalie also smiling. Stephanie was smiling. You know, Gailin was smiling. And even as adults, you know, I mean, we find this entertaining and cute. So imagine how smaller students feel, even with adults. I mean, depending on the crowd that you're dealing with. I mean, you know your students. You can... Um, use these types of activities. But PPR does not limit itself to Simon Says. Kara explained it um, very thoroughly. You know, It has to do with getting students involved in body language, articulation of the face, you know I mean? Um, things like role play are also examples of Simon Says. Um, cooperative uh, storytelling and whatnot. Let's look at another activity. Now, as you know, I love to use, you know, um, educational software. This, this particular one is from Nat Geo. And you can also use songs, just like the Simon Says song. You can use songs to teach, you know, structures or to get students to get involved more into, you know, not, not the typical, you know, subject, verb, and this and that. But as we always said, you know, introduce the grammar into context. Now, let me do a new screen share so we can go right into this thing. And let's take a quick look at this video. And the idea is that as the video goes along, if you're working with children, encourage them to sing along, you know, and to basically, you know, gesture. And you can model it yourself, like I did before, you know. Stand, you know, a little bit back and follow the video and get your students going. And I'm gonna try to make a fool out of myself here. Well, not try it. I always make a fool out of myself. I'm very good at that. Hi, everyone. Uh, Do you want to hear a song about feeling fit? Feeling Ready? fit, not me. Let's go. We like to feel fit, we like to have fun, we like to play hard, let's move now everyone. We want to feel healthy, we want to feel fit, 
Come oh, you got the idea. On, everybody. Stand, don't, don't, sit. don't sit. Come on, stand up. Try it. Come on, nice, try it. Try it. What did you do to everybody be try it. Come today? on. Bear with me. What did you do to be strong? What did you do to be fit today? What did you, what did do, you do? Did you move your legs? Yes, I, I did. did. Did you stretch your, your back? back? I did that a lot. Did you get, get enough sleep? sleep? Yes, I, I did. did. Did you eat did a healthy snack? snack? Oops, Oops, I forgot. forgot. Don't worry. Tomorrow is another day. You can try again. It's okay. We like to feel fit. We like to have fun. We like to play hard. Let's jump now, everyone. We want to feel healthy. We want to feel fit. Come on, everybody. Stand, don't sit. What did you do to be fit today? What did you do to be strong? What did you do to be fit today? What Jesus, I actually started huffing and puffing there. Because I'm not fit, I'm fat, you know. But it's, it's only one letter. The difference between fit and fat is just one letter, so one, one vowel. So I noticed some of you getting into it, and I noticed some of you really getting into it, and I see some of you smiling. So this is a very cool and easy activity to do. Now, what structure are we teaching here? Evidently, we're teaching the simple past, right? The students are doing it in a fun, engaging way, and you as a teacher also. I can't believe I'm huffing and puffing so much. Wow. Okay, okay. All right, so you get the idea. Where do you get these resources? And I've spoken about this before. Well, basically, you got Cengage, Nagio, um, Macmillan. A lot of teachers that work for institutions will have contact with these uh, editing houses. This particular series that I always show you for children is called Our World. Our World. And you can find it online uh, if you go to the National Geographic Learning you know, website. Just look for National Geographic Learning, and you have a lot of stuff. Pearson also has a lot of cool stuff. Macmillan has a lot of cool stuff. But, you know, I mean, um, I like to use mostly Nageo stuff because it's very, you know, um, and I'm not endorsing Nageo, by the way. I'm sorry. This is not a commercial presentation, of course. I'm just explaining to you, you know, the materials that I use. All right? Okie dokie. Back to the presentation. One second here. Okay. There are also, <coughs> sorry, if you don't have access to this type of software or uh, I don't really go out and purchase the stuff. You know, as a teacher, normally you have friends that work for publishing houses and they get access, you know, to these materials or that work for schools. But if you don't really want to go through all of that, then you can simply find some websites that will also provide you with, with excellent resources. Um, if you remember a lot of the websites that we looked at in the webinar that was about um, creating a lesson plan around a short story, there were a lot of cool resources there, you know, narratives and, you know, role plays and stuff that you can also use for TPR. Um, as always, I'm giving you time to write down the, the web address. I'll give you another few moments. So you can do a little yoga. Isn't it time for an adventure with Dougie? Oh, oh woof, woof. it sure is. So let's grow our beautiful butterfly wings like this and then flutter around then in a circle to, to make sure we're not touching anything. Now then, are you ready? Oh, woof, woof. Brilliant. Let's head off on an adventure with Dougie. Our first stop is the clubhouse, so jump or step your feet wide like a triangle. And take your hands wide to the side and let's stretch up and over to open one door. And the and other door. This is a cool warm-up activity, Fantastic. you know. Now, I wonder Just what Dougie has planned moving, for us today. Woof. There. Dougie wants us to find a rainbow leaf. Maybe we'll... And then work on vocabulary and stuff. So, I mean, evidently you have to watch these things prior. Yesterday I was watching some of them. Uh, some of them are not too useful. Some of them are actually pretty cool. And some of them are related to the letters, you know. I mean, some of them are related to numbers and stuff like that. 
Alpha Block's word magic. Are going to be appropriate. Let's meet so Alpha Block Z. Z enjoys nothing more than dozing off mm. and having mm. a snooze. Mm. And you can have your students emulate, you know, the little character. Time to do so. some word magic. I'm not sad. I'm more like, uh, well, actually, I am more like X. I'm, I'm right up there. Z. Ah. Zap. Zap. Then you can have your students maybe, you know, mimic what they're looking at or whatever. You're so creative, right? right? Let's look at the next research here. Next one I got for you. It's called Key Boomers. And Key Boomers is also, you know, thematic song for uh, small children. Well, well, them bones, them skeleton. Dry bones, them bones, them skeleton. Dry bones, them bones, them skeleton. Dry bones, let's shake them skeleton bones. The toe bones connected to the foot bone. The foot bones connected to the ankle bone. The ankle bones connected to the leg bone. Let's shake them skeleton bones. The leg bones connected to the knee bone. The knee bones connected to the thigh bone. The thigh bones connected to the hip bone. Let's shake them skeleton bones. Well, the hip. So this is actually fun, you know, and this would be for a class that um, where we're using CLIL, you know, content language integrated learning. And <clears throat> actually we should do one about those, uh, Cara, remind me of that. Okay. <clears throat> because I don't, I don't think we have done CLIL. CLIL is basically a technique of empowering language skills by integrating other uh, disciplines or other areas of studies. So you integrate science, you integrate history. We do it in English class anyway, you know, we always talking about health and we're talking about geography and this and that. And this would be more for like uh, English slash science you know, class. But again, here you find a whole bunch of videos and they're actually fun, you know, and they, they, the tunes are catchy and it makes it more enjoyable for you as well. I mean, I see a lot of you smiling right now and, and that's good. That's a good sign. You know, when I'm looking at people's faces and they're like, James, why are you showing us this? Saturday morning, for Christ's sake. So if you guys are enjoying it, imagine how much your students will enjoy it. Okay? And these are fun ways to learn. And, and, and the best way that human beings learn, we've spoken about this, is by doing, you know, by getting kinesthetic, by repeating, by emulating, and by playing. Why do you think we play so much as children? I mean, that's how we acquire a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the skills that will accompany, accompany us for life. Sorry. All right, so that's... Key boomers. Now, if we're going to talk about working with, you know, a larger crowd or an older crowd, so to speak, uh, teenagers and young adults and adults love this one. <clears throat> you can find it. <clears throat> you can find it uh, online at www.playcharades.net. You know, charade is basically acting out and then having people figure out what what it is that you're mimicking. And you can download it right into your phone. You know, there's an application for it. So what you can have is you can have your students download the app. Let me see if I have it here. And once your students have the application installed, right? And there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, a whole bunch of charades applications. Have your students download the same application. It's a lot easier that way. And then you can start the game, right? By not sharing screen, of course. And I'm gonna give you an example right now. And we're all gonna play. And whoever gets the answer first is gonna unmute themselves and tell me what it is that I'm trying to mimic. Let's go first to the web page. And again, this is cool because it gives you the phrase. It gives you a scoreboard and it gives you a time limit. So it's, it's pretty organized, it's pretty cool, right? And again, like I said, you can also get it on Google Play, okay? So you can choose the category. I'm going to choose actions, okay? Well, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna stop sharing the screen because I'm actually gonna play with you guys and you're going to try. And since I can't have you all on the screen, you know, simultaneously, 
What I'm going to ask you to do is, okay, we're going to go with actions. Ready? Basically, unmute yourselves when you're ready to, to, to respond. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get everybody on screen here. Okay, and I'm looking for, okay, this is the one that I was looking for, all right, so, are you ready? So, with my fingers, I'm going to show you how many, how many words, right? Three words. Hand out. Eating. Eating. Food. Feeding. Eating. So, plant. No, you said it. One, who said feeding? Okay. So the first okay. word's feeding. Feeding, feeding. Okay, feeding. I couldn't see anything. Ducks. Ducks. Who said that? Oh, yeah. it was it was on the screen earlier. We actually saw it, so I was oh. cheating. I already knew the answer. Oh, <laughs> oh cool. Okay. Oh, okay. Swick. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Oh, All right. hi, Poppy. Well, I mean, Poppy was basically uh, just to get you know the the. Okay. Wow. This is a an easy one. Okay. Ready? Okay, here we go. Two words. Two words. Eat. Eating. Eating. Eat. Open. Spaghetti. Getty. Get it? Spaghetti. <laughs> Getty. All right, so it's not that difficult. So. Actually, the one that, that I showed you right now was eating spaghetti, okay? So it's a very cool application. You don't have to kill yourself, you know, thinking of the categories. You go to a new charade, and of course, I wasn't going to do this one, body surfing at the beach, you know, it would take me a while. Uh, but then you can simply go through, you know, paddling in a canoe. And if you don't want to do actions, you can do Christmas, Thanksgiving, books, movies, phrases, uh, and it all depends on the kind of crowd that you have or the kind of students that you have. Or also, <clears throat> it can be, you know, the vocabulary that you're working on. You even have songs. Okay? And then you can simply surf through it. So what I would do at this point with my students is the student that gave me the correct answer, then it's his or her turn. And so on and so after and get everybody involved. Okay. So it's a really, really cool activity to do. It's not difficult to do it. I mean... I just did it with 36 people. And the cool thing with Zoom is that you can, you know, I mean, put the general view and see all the little squares and see everybody. And it's fun. Okay. And I noticed that, I mean, you ladies and gentlemen, you know, got into it. So that's always fun. All right. Okie dokie. Let me switch back to speaker view and get back to the presentation because I still have more for you. That's always. That's not all. All right. So. Placerate.net or simply just, I mean, you can access it, uh, basically go on Chrome or whatever browser you're using, and then it will give you this little tab over here so you can get it on Google Play and download it straight into your phone, or you can get a whole bunch of them, you know, free, right online, uh, or on the Apple Store if you have an uh, iPhone, or, you know, on the Android Store. All right, cool. For the next one. Okay. Now, this one, teflastic wordpress.com, and I'm going to give you a little moment so you can copy that long, 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 long web address. It's actually a page that I found with a whole bunch of resources for TPR. Again, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, surf the web, take your time, look for activities. I mean, don't reinvent the wheel. I always tell you that. Uh, I, 
I get a lot of my stuff just basically from the web. And the stuff that I show you evidently is not my original, you know, creation. That's a mistake that a lot of uh, trainers make, you know. They, they come on these webinars or they give these conferences or they play these instruction videos saying, okay, so I'm going to show you this thing that I've developed. Why? When there's so much stuff out there that you can take advantage of, right? All right, give me a thumbs up when you get the web address down. Okay, most people got it. Cool. All right, cool. Couple yeah. static. All right. Here we go. Now, this particular one, you know, Tefl static, which I think is very cop aesthetic or dope aesthetic, if you're familiar with those expressions. It's a web page where you find articles on TPR adult classes, physical games using body language, TPR games, Tefl games with miming TPR, photocopial, photo, photocopiable, ah, photocopiable, never mind. Uh, TPR worksheet for adults. I hope I'm not having a stroke right now. All right, bad joke. Grammar worksheets. And, and then you have, you know, um, activities that also go into, you know, business English, hobbies, medical English. That's a big one for me because um, I do have a lot of private classes with doctors, you know, as sort of like one of my areas of, uh, of action, so to speak, of expertise. And then if you keep scrolling down, you have everything and anything that you could possibly imagine. So I actually accidentally bumped into this page uh, this week while I was, you know, preparing for this webinar. And I said, well, why not? Why not share it? Everything's here, pretty much, okay? Comparative and superlative, singular and plural TPR worksheets, uh, worksheets for teaching gestures, other uses of miming, and so on and so after, right? So again, go out there, have fun. And TPR is one of the coolest ways to make your class more enjoyable, to increase, you know, I mean, student talk versus teacher talk, and basically to have fun and everything else that Kara, you know, thought us at the beginning of the presentation. Okay. Okay. All right. Now I'm gonna switch the presentation back to Karen, so we can get to our Q&A session, right? And we're doing great timing here. Where did Karen go? I'm here. Yeah, no, it's just on, 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 on the list. Oh, I should of, be at uh, the very top. I'm Global TEFL. I'm not Kara. I'm Global TEFL. Yeah, I know, but I, oh, okay, I just got that. I got you. Thanks. Uh-huh. Yeah, perfect. Okay, over to you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, James, you showed some uh, really, really great resources there. So uh, yeah, I think we're open for, for any questions. If uh, anybody has some, go ahead. Who'd like to go first? Hello. Hi, Patricia. Um, yeah, I'm just apologize for coming in late. My yeah, question no is um, using TPR about the lesson plan. Is it wise to adjust a children's lesson plan to an adult? Because I understand what Mr. James said, don't reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. but adapt the lesson plan. Mm -hmm. Would that make sense? 100%. So I think so many elements of teaching can be adapted. So many games, so many resources can be adapted. So definitely you don't have to go out there and like said, James said, develop all of these things yourself. You can adapt to so much and uh, so much of uh, your own experiences as well. I definitely think when it comes to games and resources and things like this, I always think of things that I did as a, as a kid, games that I played as a kid, um, things that I like to do. How can I adapt that and make it fun and make it a learning an enjoyable learning experience. So this will come with knowing your students as well. So if you have a class of regular students who are adults, 
you will know what they're interested in, what kind of learners they are. And so this will allow you to take certain games and activities that are for kids and to develop them and change them and adapt them to make them a little bit more difficult or maybe practice different areas with adults. Definitely. I find a lot of the material can be adapted and like what we said before in a couple of other webinars is when you're planning you always want to plan a couple of extra things or plan a different few ways where you can extend the topic and extend the language and so when you're looking at games for younger students and you want to adapt them to older students, uh, this will come in handy because you want to think, oh, you're constantly thinking of how can I expand on this? How can I develop this? So definitely a lot of the resources um, can be uh, adapted from uh, one to the other. I hope that Thank helps. you. No Thank problem you. Yes. At all. Thank you. Uh, all right. Oh, hang on. Sorry, Ooh, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, okay, perfect. So, Aaron, do you want to go ahead first? Natalie will come to you after. Okay, uh, th thank, you so, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I, I'm, so, I'm so bothered ab uh, about uh, this TPR. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's something on, on my head a while ago that I, I want to address uh, some of the questions that I want to ask. Uh, yes, sure. How are we able to teach uh, deaf students or ADHD students who has no control on, on their own? Yeah, so this is a really good question. I think uh, when it comes to dealing with the students who maybe have difficulty with paying attention um, or difficulty sitting still, this is where we spoke before about making sure that you tailor your lessons and tailor your style of teaching to suit your child. So find out what interests this student, what way can you tailor your lesson? What games, what props, what TPR can you use that might interest the student? Also, maybe your student doesn't have to, you know, sit down for the entirety of the class. For me, when I was teaching in a classroom um, more so, I was not so strict on having my students sit down all the time and sit in their in their chairs. If students wanted to get up or walk around, I spent a lot of my time teaching younger students actually sitting on the floor. And um, that's just a personal preference of mine. If the student was in a smaller group, it means you could interact more. So if you have an issue with a child who's up and about and moving around, try and include that in your lesson. Try and get them involved asking what they are doing um, and then use all of your combined resources as well. So when we're teaching online, we you can use your TPR, so your face, your hands, and then like what James showed us as well, you can use videos, you can use sound, you can use extra props. So if you have a student who has a hearing difficulties as well, you have so many other resources available to you too. We can type so that they can can read as well uh, what you are trying to say to them. So it's a combination of uh, all of these aspects that will help you to deal with the students in these kind of situations. Okay, uh, I have another question. Uh -huh. um, um, uh, is sign language is close to TPR? Sign language is a language in itself. So British Sign Language is a language in itself. So no, the symbolism and the sign that you would have is not necessarily similar to TPR. TPR can be adapted to you as a personal teacher. So like I said before, in my classes, I usually have I, my, have, then we have things like look, see, listen, that's what I use in my classroom. What you use in your classroom, what Natalie uses in hers, what James uses in his, that's 
can all be different and can all be interpreted. If you're learning BSL, British Sign Language, that's a language just like learning English, just like learning French. So the signs that you will learn for that is to help you to deal with communicate um, with people who are deaf or hard of hearing. So they are different. You as a teacher may decide to include some BSL, some British Sign Language, or whatever sign language you're learning into your classroom. That's absolutely fine if you think if that's where your brain goes and that's what you associate with what you're trying to teach. That's absolutely not a problem. But as a whole, TPR and a sign language are two, um, two different things, definitely. Okay, that will be my two questions for, uh, no for problem tonight. At all. Right, let me, thank you so much. No problem. Hi, right, guys. Let me jump in there for a second, Aaron. Um, just to elaborate a little bit more on what Kara says. Um, on the first part, where you mentioned, you know, students were hyperactive and this and that, there's something that I used to love to do when I interviewed um, teachers back at my days, you know, as a school principal. And I would, of course, have, you know, some of the teachers helping me out with the setting of the scenario and whatnot, my accomplices, so to speak. And I would show the new teacher or the teacher candidate two classrooms. One classroom where students were sitting in rows, apparently paying very close attention to a teacher that, you know, was exposing or was explaining, you know, some sort of content. And then I would show them this other classroom that it appeared to be total chaos. Teacher was in there, you know, smiling and laughing and, you know, going around the classroom. Kids were moving around, talking, interacting, playing this and that. And I would always ask them this question. Where do you think learning is taking place? Classroom one or classroom two? What do you think, Aaron? Mm -hmm. uh, I, can, I cannot guess, honestly. Uh, I cannot guess, honestly, uh, which classroom is better. But, uh, but no, I no, no, no. The question is not which one is better. The question is, in which classroom is learning taking place? Mm, okay. I think classroom one for me. Okay, and that's uh, the most typical mistake for, for teachers. See, in classroom one, you have teaching going on. In classroom two, you have learning going on because students are engaged. Students are interacting. The teacher is basically, you know, guiding the activities. But when we do, we learn. I'm gonna tell you a little story. Uh, a little boy and a little girl are talking, they're brother and sister. And the little girl says to the, to the brother, you know what, I taught the dog how to speak. No, really? Yes, I taught the dog how to say, you know, I'm hungry and I, I taught him some phrases. Can you show me? He's like, yeah, Spot, come here. And Spot comes, you know. Okay, Spot, speak. The little boy looks at the girl, he's like, oh, Spot, speak. <laughs> like, wait a second, did he tell me you taught him how to speak? Yeah, I taught him, I didn't say he learned. You get it? So we teach a lot in a traditional classroom, but students don't learn too much. Go back to your days as a student. How much did you learn from these actual, you know, traditional classes? How much do you remember from third grade or fourth grade from the lectures? You know what I remember? I remember making a rock collection and basically categorizing all the different rocks. I remember when I had to give my first uh, oral presentation on Edgar Allan Poe and I almost fainted, you know, I had to put my back to the wall. See, that's how learning takes place. And that's what I like to always explain to younger teachers because we are still trained in this, you know, old paradigm where we think that learning takes place, you know, when you know, we have students perfectly sitting down like little robots, you know, industrial revolution type of thing. You know, we have the little clones that we have to, you know, input information into and they go into process it. Learning does not take place that way, all right? Teaching takes place that way. Learning takes place with active interaction. Now, regarding your second question, when it comes to sign language, sign language is a language in itself, like Kara said, but how do you use it with TPR? Well, you use sign language to give students instructions. And I don't know sign language, but if you're doing some sort of gesture with sign language that says jump and your students jump, then that's TPR. Do you understand? So any language can be combined to TPR because TPR is basically you create some sort of stimulus, verbal or visual stimulus, to which students will 
react or respond physically, and that's DPR. All right, Aaron? Okay, thank you so much for sharing you, that ideas. Thank you so much. All right, no I problem. appreciate your answers. Thank you so much. Oh. Right, so I think we'll go to Natalie next, and then after Natalie, we have Shani and then Pepe. Awesome. Thank you so much for today. It was so interesting. It was so awesome watching you use your hands, and, and I was just like, <laughs> I was captivated. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, this week I was busy doing my um, children's lesson plan, and um, I found some really cool stuff online. I found a beautiful, like I did Simon Says as a Warmer, and this whole thing was about kitchen um, vocabulary, with like the like the, all the pieces of stuff that's in the kitchen, plus the prepositions. So that the kids were practicing placing different things and building kitchens and instructing each other to build kitchens. So there was all the activities were there, you know, in terms of the theory, unstructured, structured, blah blah blah. Yeah. But at the end of it, I sort of got to a place where I was like, we didn't sing any songs, we didn't do like there wasn't anything like where I could say I did TPR besides the Simon Says at the beginning, and I was a bit like, how could I? have incorporated that I mean and I know you've given me these resources today but like that was where I sat yesterday going I feel like I, 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 now now I needed to incorporate some of that and I wasn't sure how because everything was so I'd already been very specific in my like my lesson plan I think teaching online in those kind of situations, you can use so many props that are around you. A little bit difficult, obviously, you're not going to be able to take your entire oven or microwave into the room that you're teaching, but you can definitely have a pictures, maybe make your own flashcards. So for me, I know I make uh, an entire alphabet. So I have individual cards for each letter, big and small. I keep uh, props for things like, uh, what's the weather like outside? Is it, is it, is it? Uh, so you can use loads of different props that you have inside your house. Take a fork, take a knife. If you're doing prepositions, you may not necessarily need to include all of your kitchen vocabulary. So like I said earlier, here's my box. Great. Uh, students, can you tell me, where is the box? Oh no, hmm, where is the box? I can't see it. So you can uh, include TPR in a lots of uh, different ways. So you don't necessarily have to uh, include it in uh, the section that you're uh, like have all your vocabulary in. You can use it to practice just a certain elements of it. Also, sometimes remember if you're on a laptop, you can pick up and a move. So I've done it before where my students had difficulty with the stairs, going up the stairs and going down the stairs. The best way I found to teach was to unplug myself from my office, go outside into my hallway and walk up and down the stairs with my student with the laptop. And I just showed them. So you could do the same thing, pick up your laptop, walk into your kitchen and point them and ask them about what you have in your kitchen, what's beside your oven, what's beside their oven, what do you put in an oven, can I put my teddy bear in an oven, so I'm just pointing to a teddy bear, encouraging some a different language while still practicing the phrase and the vocabulary that you had in class. So there are loads of different ways that you can uh, incorporate this. So you can use it with the, maybe not just your vocabulary, but practicing that grammar structure of uh, prepositions of uh, where they go. So think about what you have uh, in your house. Think about what you have around you that you can use. Thank you, that's very helpful. I really no appreciate it. No problem at all. Shani, we'll come to, uh, to you next. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can indeed. Awesome. Cara and James, thank you so much for the class and hi to my virtual stu fellow students. Thank Everybody you. Else. Shani in Cape Town, South Africa. It's, it's not quite a TPL question. I'm still very, very new to this. Yeah. And Originally, my, my, uh, my thought was to teach adults, um, but I think kids look a whole load more fun. So what I wanted to ask you was, um, you know, upon qualifying um, 
uh, and finishing everything and, you know, getting my certificate and the rest of it, would you suggest or um, do, you, do you say start with children and then go to adults or do you say just do whatever you want? I mean, how does it, how does it actually work? That's a great question and I don't know if there is a, any definite answer to it. For me, myself, when I started, I wanted to teach adults also, especially with the background in, in Mandarin Chinese. I graduated and I really felt that with uh, my skill set and with my knowledge of the language that I would be much better suited towards a teaching adults, teaching a business English. And... I was super surprised after about three months into teaching younger students. Um, I loved it. And about six months in, I didn't want to teach anybody over the age of 10. So okay. it, was, it was a huge shock for me. Now that has a change since I've come to the UK. I have gotten much stronger at my adult teaching skills and I do teach adults and I do teach business English and I love it. So my advice to you would be to try it like that. I don't think there's any definite way to go. I think you will learn and develop skill sets that will complement you either way. And like I said before, that can be adapted to either one, but try it out. Uh, if you feel like you want to head towards teaching a younger student, then head down that direction. See how it feels, see what it likes, see what it's like, see if you like it. And if there's an opportunity in the future to uh, try um, teaching a different level of students and you feel like that's something you'd like to try, then try. I don't think there's any right or wrong path to take. I think ESL is a continuously growing industry. There's opportunities everywhere. And like I said, the skills that you will learn, you will able to be able to transfer and will be able to adapt so i would just suggest to go with what uh, you feel the most comfortable with and with what makes you the most happy at the end of the day i think uh, that's the biggest thing with with teaching and like what we said before be your students being able to mirror your your enthusiasm and if you enjoy your classes and you enjoy teaching, then your students are going to be the same. So just to find the area that you enjoy the most. And that may take some trial and error, but that's okay. Because like I said, I've been doing this for four years and I change my mind all of the time about uh, who I like to teach and, and what level I like to teach. So yes, I think younger students are so much fun to teach. It's incredibly uh, fun and, and incredibly happy high energy but at the same time I've really felt a really strong connection with my older students and we've had some really interesting discussions really interesting um, topics of conversation especially around culture as well and so I'm now beginning to um, get a lot of enjoyment out of those classes as well so it will just be time uh, and it will just be a learning curve for for you as you develop and develop your skills. Okay. Right. Thank right, you. Let me jump. So you, Shani, sorry. don't go away because I want to compliment what no, I won't saying. run away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing is that I don't want anybody to get confused because what Kara said is exactly the perfect, correct answer. However, there's a lot of literature out there, and I don't want you to get confused based on the old paradigm. The old paradigm was you get a teacher, you start them up with the upper levels where it was easier to teach, basically adults. And then as you train the teacher, then you train them, you know, into TYL and whatnot. And as they advanced, you know, when you felt they were prepared, you would let them teach little children. Uh, why am I making this clarification? Because there's a lot of stuff out there that you, most of you guys and gals may have read. And you may be saying, yeah, but, you know, Carrie's telling us this, but I read that. Yes, if you read that, that was the old paradigm. And that okay. changed. In the new paradigm, in, a, in an institution, what we do is we do a personality profile. And we basically ask key questions with the help of, you know, educational psychologists to a teacher such as yourself, Shani, to help determine which age level you're better suited for. Okay. Tara, evidently, I mean, talking to her after 20 minutes, I would say definitely children. She's got the soft voice. She's got the nice demeanor the big smile, you know, like one of you said, she mesmerizes you with, with her hands. And I can only imagine, you know, kids just 
bum rushing her. But if you put me in a kid's class, as much as I enjoy it, you know, it's like I put in Shrek in there. The kids will look at me like, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pretty big guy, you know, I'm 220 pounds and, and I'm six foot one. So imagine me in a, in a little preschool environment, you know, Jolly Green Giant, you know, standing there where kids will be terrorized. So, <laughs> so in my case, my profile is better suited for business English because of my background in business and whatnot. And I just wanted to throw that in there. So, so there's no misunderstanding. The, the answer that Cara just gave you is the answer coherent with 21st century pedagogy and with all the new research and the new paradigms, just so we don't get confused with what's out there because a lot of people still defend the old paradigm. And let me tell you, we don't. Because that's basically, that, that, that's just like the paradigm of saying all, 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 all students are the same. So I got to teach all students in the same format. All teachers are not the same. We're all different. We all have different qualities. We have different, I mean, types of personality. A lot of us are, well, a lot of them, like are more charismatic. A lot of us are grumpier, such as myself. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm very good with my child, but I'm not very good with other children. Not because I don't want to, but it's not in my nature. That's something that you need to determine about yourself, Shani. So follow Kara's advice, please. And also Try another thing another thing to think about is the classroom learning and online learning are different too. So you may find that you enjoy teaching a younger level in a classroom, but enjoy teaching an older level online because there are different elements of classroom learning and younger learning. You may find maybe in a classroom, it's much easier to keep the energy up, to keep your students' attention. Whereas if you are online and you're dealing with young students, you might find that difficult. So that's something else to think about as well. What environment will you be teaching in? Because that may affect the age group that you want to connect with as well. Right. Thank you. No problem at all. Peppy, Thank you're you very much. You. Such an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thanks, James. Hi. Hi, Kara. Hi, James. Hi, um, so I'm currently transitioning between uh, transitioning from classroom facilitation to online facilitation. I'm also um, an accredited whole brain practitioner. I'm not going to go into what that is, but you alluded earlier on to the left and right brain. So basically that, that's what it's about. And that's why this whole thing resonated so well with me in terms of total physical response, because you, you have to have a holistic approach in a classroom, whether it's uh, online or physical. Um, in, in terms of some people are going to respond to facts and figures and other people are going to respond to pictures and um, singing and um, deep thinking. So, so everybody is different in, in a classroom. My challenge right now is how to put that into practice in an online environment where, number one, I don't see half the people because they insist on keeping their videos off um, with the excuse of bandwidth. Um, I think sometimes it is genuine, but I don't think it's always genuine. I think sometimes people are just not there. They, they pretend to be there. <laughs> um, so, so that's my challenge. But I do, I, it's not really a question, but just I'm throwing it out there. The, the, the necessity to, to have a total approach as a, as a teacher, um, to be able to, to reach those who are analytical as well as those who are more um, risk takers or uh, the, um, strategic thinkers, those who are more people, 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 and those who are analytical. So it is, um, yeah, challenging. Yeah. Yeah, great. And that's a great uh, phrase, a holistic approach. I really like that, a holistic approach to learning. Um, and I think that really kind of hits the nail on the head. We want to try and create um, a total learning environment, something, a whole learning environment that uses everything that we possibly can to get involved 100%. Like you said, we've got loads of different types of learners. So if you're somebody who's a little bit more analytical, somebody who's kinesthetic, somebody who learns just from a writing and reading, somebody who learns visually, you have to remember that just like there's loads of different 
styles of teaching and loads of different types of teaching, there's loads of different types of learners as well. And so by sticking everybody in a classroom and making them face forward and, and watch a board, like James said earlier, is that teaching or is that, is that learning? Um, and so, yeah, that's a really good point. We need to try and think of encompassing absolutely everybody together. Sometimes when you're teaching online 100%, you will deal with students who don't want to turn their, their video on, don't want to turn their mic on, they turn it on and off during the class. I think that's just part and parcel of uh, online teaching. I think every teacher does deal with this. We mentioned it a little bit last week about um, trying to pay attention, use your other senses to see if you can hear them. Are they tapping on the keyboard? Is there music playing? Is there a TV on in the background? So are they there? Are they listening? Or like you said, have they turned the laptop on, sit it over in the corner of the room so it looks like you're there, but they're gone about their normal life. Um, and so for this, again, this is where you need to kind of look at it in two areas. One, if you're dealing with older students, they're older students. You know, you don't have to baby them. If they're paying for your lessons or, you know, they want to be in your lessons, if they come to class and they pay attention, they do or they don't, you're a grown-up person. That's your decision whether or not you want to take part and whether or not you want to do your homework, you know, just like in university. If you go into university or you, you don't go to your lectures or you're not doing your homework, your university lecturer isn't going to come up to you and ask you specifically why your homework hasn't been done. You're an independent person and so you should be partaking in independent learning. But on the flip side of this, we need to think about then maybe as a, your style of teaching or the content isn't uh, hitting the key areas of interest for your student. So if this is the case, maybe we need to think about what we can include in our, in our lessons and um, that might draw more people in, that more people might be paying attention. Um, and so that's another area that we have to think about. It can, it, there's a double, a double edged sword, let's say there are two sides to this coin. So it can be a, a student issue, but it can also be an issue with the, the way we teach or, or the content or timing issue. Also, we need to think of cultural elements as well. There may be an embarrassment issue there. They may be quite shy, depending on what culture you're um, teaching to, what area of the world you're in. That's something else to think about, especially if, you're, if your students are a little bit older, they may not be so willing to speak freely in a class with uh, quite a lot of people and, uh, and make a mistake. So these are some, some things to, to think about um, in the future, trying to draw in all of our students online. Absolutely, thank you so much. I think that no really problem. is- No problem. Let me, as always, yeah. Pepe, let, let me compliment yeah. that. If you notice <laughs> when I started the activity um, and I said, okay, everybody stand up and this and that and let's do it, only maybe two or three people did it. And then as we started getting into it, you know, I was like, come on. Then I noticed some people going like this. Mm, okay. <laughs> and then those people, you know, after 10 seconds, they were like, yay. And then other people started doing it. So it's like, sort of like a domino effect. What Kara said, again, Kara, right? You know, hit the nail right in the head. Very nice. It's all about finding the activities that will engage people, no matter how old they are. Okay. And, and I saw some of our older teachers here on screen, very apprehensive at first. They were like, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not a kid. And then 20 seconds later, they were like, hey, you know, jumping up and down and this and that and hopping and puffing like me, right? So it's all about the enthusiasm that, that you kick into the class. It's something that I teach uh, about classroom management. How do you get students who are disengaged from the class and maybe, you know, chatting on their phones engaged? You start doing something so much fun, people start going like this. What's going on over there? As humans, you know, we tend to follow the crowd. That, that, that's a normal, you know, I mean, human reaction. And, and it's like, for example, if I want students to pay attention in, in something very simple to get people engaged, and I'm going to do it with you guys right now. So if you're paying attention, clap once. If you're paying attention, clap twice. If you're paying attention, clap three times. If you're paying attention, clap four times. So by the fourth clap, everybody was clapping. You get my point? So at first, you know, some people clapped. So I got you all on like the general screen here. And then they were like, why am I not doing this? 
And you might feel uncomfortable at first, but when you see everybody else doing it, then you say, okay, this is cool. And you get into it, no matter how old you are. So it's also a matter of, like you said it before, you know, the holistic class, making activities enjoyable. And I don't care how old you are. Everybody likes to play. I don't care how grumpy and, and how old and how, I mean, how much of a scrooge you may be. You see people, other people having fun, you want to jump in there. It's like like the effect that you see in a concert or even in a, in a church, you know, where everybody gets into the euphoria and everybody starts jumping in there. It's a natural human reaction. Play with that and you get excellent results, right? So again, Cara, nice. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right, who else would like to uh, ask a question? All right. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then. Oh, Stephanie. Stephanie wants oh, to. Okay, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, Cara, James. No, sorry, that's just. Fine. It's actually not a question, it's something that um, I thought I'll share with you guys that I thought was very interesting, just getting back to the different types of learning. Um, you often have these kids that really need to physically move around to be able to, to learn and to take in what they're busy seeing or hearing or whatever. And something very interesting that I found in a study um, here in Namibia in the schools is that now also with the online, whether you're online or whether you are um, inside the classroom, to get these big exercise gym balls that you blow up. I don't know whether you guys uh, know To what use to about. sit on instead of yeah. a chair. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and I thought I'll just mention it. Also, listening to what, what Aaron was asking, um, if you do have a child that's quite like this and you have an activity now where the child needs to be seated in a, at a table, it really helps to give them a ball like that to be able to just move it. It could be quite irritating online to see this child hopping about the whole time, but it, the, the difference that it made in, in the amount of um, information the child was actually learning was incredible. So I thought I'll just throw that out there. Yeah, and great. Thank That's... you very much. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, there you go. James has one, a little space hopper. I also have a big yoga ball. That's great. I think that's a really, really cool idea. Thank you so much for, no, for uh, adding that in. 100%. I think, like I said before, maybe the child needs to sit on the floor. We don't know. Yeah. We're there to try and facilitate as much learning as possible. And so exactly that. If the kid just needs to sit and, and bounce up and down, absolutely fine. If the child child is doing something and you can see on the video get involved hey james what's that yeah. wow oh, right james, that's cool can you show me wow sure. show cool then? james okay. what do you use this for <laughs> wow james <laughs> what are you doing i think i squashed it my son is going to be <laughs> mad at me now <laughs> But get involved with your student. I've had it before where students have had teddy bears under their arms. I have two teddy bears here. I was like, wow, what do you have? Look what I have. Get involved with the kids. But I love that idea of having something to bounce on or, you know, allowing the, the, the student to be in a comfortable environment. Because think about yourself. You know, we've all been through school. I don't know how many people speak a second or a third language, but think about how you like to learn. Think about what situations make you a little bit embarrassed or a little bit shy. That's exactly how your students are going to be feeling. So anything that we can do that encourages a relaxed, warm, learning-friendly environment is all a big plus. So I love that idea. And if anybody tries it out and gets their, 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 their students sitting on little bouncy balls, definitely let us know how it goes. <laughs> My, uh, my son is hyperactive, you saw him earlier, and that's why I have all of these tools at home, one of the you know, advantages of being a parent. And believe me, by experience, I can tell you it works wonderfully. I mean, he spends all day just bouncing up and down. He was actually upset at me when he saw me jumping on his balls. He was like, oh my God, daddy's going to squash it. <laughs> but that was fun. Yep. Super. So, uh, any more questions before we, before we head off? Nope. Super. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, again, for uh, attending. Thank you. Uh, we really support. Thank you. We really are grateful for all of the support. And uh, I don't know what our next one will, will be on. I'm not sure if we have decided that, but we'll let you guys know. And well, then... um, a little note into that, uh, Kara. I was waiting for this part of the webinar. Uh, would anybody like to share some...
topics that you would like to see on future webinars? Um, I always like to ask uh, because we always get good ideas from you guys. Anybody? Uh, bullying, if you have anything already. Um, okay, we could look into that one. Adult or children. Okay. All right. I Anybody know, else? I think maybe we looked at or I spoke about uh, possibly doing specific webinars on games in each area as well. So maybe specific games for question and answer, specific games for vocabulary, spe specific games for reading and literacy, specific games for, for this. So that might be something we might be able to do as well. Oh, then we also Could should we do email one of... you some topics. Of course, if definitely. think of a few topics. Definitely. Of course, by all means. Uh, now I'm answering my emails. <laughs> Pepe, you wanted to say something? No? Okay, anybody else? Any suggested topics? Nothing? Uh, like one? Stephanie. Oh, yeah. Aaron, okay, go ahead. Aaron, go ahead. Okay, uh, James, uh, I, I want to suggest uh, different types of vocabularies by level, each level, from easy, intermediate, until to advanced level. Maybe Teaching that can, vocabulary? Can, Yes, by so we can, yeah. by proficient level, by proficient, uh, proficient level, from easy, uh, normal until to advanced level. Well, usually we go by the uh, CFR, you know, Common European Framework of Reference, and uh, if you write me, Aaron, I can send you actually um, a list of what mm. type of vocabulary you should teach at each level. Okay. You have my email, right? Okay, much better. Uh, I, right. I have your email. No worries. Okay, cool. Not a Thank problem. You. May I ask right. what your email address is, please? My email? Okay, one second. Let me put it on screen for you. Okay, it's academic.support. Just like it sounds. Okay. At, at mm -hmm. globaltefl. Okay. .uk.com. .uk.com. Awesome. Yeah, the same web page where you've where you done your course. Uh, basically, okay. academic support at that page. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay, great, guys. So, like we said, any other thoughts that you've had or any other issues or topics that you think you might like to hear, then just uh, send James a quick email to that address and we'll definitely see what we can do. But for now, thank you so much, everybody, for attending today and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. We hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, guys. See you next thank time. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.